Hello and welcome everyone who is watching this live or coming to see it at a later date. And I'm talking today with Joe Schmid. Um, I think a lot of people who watch my channel are kind of already familiar vaguely either, well, through like, uh, my demographic's quite weird because I've got people who've been with me like when I was a Christian, people who have come because they're interested in philo philosophy stuff, people who have come who are more on like the atheist side. So people might have seen you like talking to um, T-Jump and they might have been in like T-Jump's audience for that kind of conversation. People might have seen you because they're interested in the philosophy stuff you're putting out there. They might have seen you um, talking with like Alex Malpass and Graham Oppy, um, or they might never have come across you before. So uh, do you want to briefly say what you're doing with your channel, Majesty of Reason? And I'm about halfway through your um, little book, Majesty of Reason. I don't know if that prompted you to start the channel or how, how you kind of got into it, if you want to just outline that. Yeah, yeah. So my channel is one of those like COVID channels, you know, so I, I was just bored. And I'm like, what am I going to do? Um, I like I like teaching people about philosophy. So I'll just make a channel. And so I did that in like late April or something, I think. And uh, yeah, it's been really, really fun ever since. Um, and yeah, so what I do on there, um, I do discussions with different philosophers like Rob Coons, Graham Oppie, Josh Rasmussen, and so on, uh, on a whole host of topics, but usually within philosophy of religion. Um, but also you like epistemology, um, you know, metaphysics, causation, things like that. Uh, and I also do kind of lecture style videos as well. So I like to prepare slides and, you know, do like a, a quasi transcript. Sometimes they're off the cuff, sometimes not, but, um, yeah, just teaching, teaching philosophy. And the book did precede that. Um, yeah, but I, I, I kind of, the book gave me more of a reason to do it because I was like, well, hey, I've already got the book. It, the name is there. I can promote the book on it and, and things like that. So, um, yeah. And it, it's right to say you're doing um, philosophy at, at university with biology. Like, um, I don't quite understand how that is. Is that like a minor major thing in American university? Yeah. Departments? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, I, I, my major is philosophy, my minor is biology, yeah. So it, it's a little weird and I don't know how to explain it here. Um, I mean, I, <laughs> but it would take a while, so. So, yeah, so, so we, but, but, like research in philosophy is. Oh, did, well, did you cut out your end or is that me? Uh, also. Okay, am I back? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if that's your internet cutting out or me uh, there, um, but you did go choppy um, on me. Uh, let me just see in the chat, okay. people. Well, yeah, people now, so. yeah, yeah, you can carry on by all means, but people might have like um, caught everything you said and it just, oh yeah, um, I, yeah, it seems like it was your internet. <laughs> where it, so yeah, do you want to, do you mind well, just uh, repeating? Yeah, you're back for me, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. So like I said, uh, I'm majoring in philosophy, minoring in biology. Um, it's a little little weird and I don't really have time to explain it, but I do, um, you know, actual sort of scholarly research within um, metaphysics, philosophy, religion, things like that, writing papers um, uh, for uh, journals and things like that, uh, and also like refereeing papers and things like that, so. Mm -hmm. And how's it, you kind of ended up getting into philosophy going down this avenue? Like, was it always something that you've been interested in? Was it an interest you picked up in university and then being in that environment allowed you to like foster that or, um, I, yeah, how, how did it come about? Yeah, well, um, so I grew up in a very conservative Christian home. And um, so for that reason, I attended a, a private Catholic school K through 12th uh, grade. So it's so, a so really young age. And every single day, uh, you know, we have theology classes. And so theology is pretty similar to um, philosophy of religion. I mean, it's it's distinct and it's different in a lot of ways, but at least, you know, it's got some overlaps with it. And so that kind of, you know, naturally sparked some kind of interest. Um, but my interest in philosophy in particular kind of grew out of an interest in biology and um, particularly in roughly seventh grade, you know, uh, we started learning about evolutionary biology and I just thought it was so fascinating, so beautiful and so interesting. Um, you know, I, I remember always, I would always just like look at my hand and I was like, this developed like uh, over natural selection over the hundreds of millions of years. And it was always so cool. So um, that really fascinated me. And then, you know, as I started, you know, getting older, eighth grade, ninth grade, things like that, I started reflecting more on the evolutionary process. And, you know, just thinking about the profound languishing and suffering and death and predation for hundreds of millions of years for non-human animals. And so that really, you know, made me start to question my faith and, and things like that. And of course, you know, 
during this time, I'm like always talking with friends about these sorts of things and, you know, reading online, different like uh, blogs and things like that. Um, and so, you know, one, and that kind of got me down on the track of philosophy. And then once you start, you're never really going to go back. So, um, yeah, so then it kind of tumbled, tumbled out of control there. And then I, I got into all sorts of different philosophical um, interests. So, yeah. Do you, um, I suppose there's a couple of things I want to ask about that. Like, um, so during that time, would you have considered yourself like a devout Catholic? Like, um, uh, you know, is there, is there a point in time where you kind of converted to Christianity? And do you remember being particularly um, religious, say, or something like that? Or, or for you, was it always like a nominal thing because you were kind of bought, born into it and it was just how you went to school and what you did? And uh, That's a great question. Um, it, it was very devout or devote or people will say it differently. <laughs> froze you, again. You chopped, you, yeah, you froze out a little bit. Um, I got, I got, um, people say it differently. I got that bit. <laughs> and you're okay. back. Yeah, people say <laughs> devote, devout. Um, I'll, I'll just, I'll just use, I'll refrain from using the word. Um, so yeah, okay. well, I guess I'll use it one. <laughs> devout um, and committed. Uh, it I don't wasn't, know. <laughs> It wasn't just nominal. It wasn't just going through the steps. You know, um, I was, you know, a fervent believer in it from a very young age. And I tend to take things uh, very seriously. You know, it's like I took my faith seriously and things like that. So um, and I tend to care really deeply about lots of things. So like if it was important to me, then I cared a lot about it. And so I was, I was very devout. Um, yeah. And then so it was never like converting to it because I was sort of born into it. But um, I, I took it very seriously and, you know, prayed and, and all sorts of things like that. And then, you know, there was never some single point of time where it's like, you know what, I'm just not a, you know, I don't mm -hmm. believe anymore, you know, something like that. It's more so this very long and protracted gradual process of so many different factors culminating over months to years um, in that kind of uh, ninth, 10th ish grade, you know, like those kind of one or two years where it's just this huge process of exploration and, and kind of deconstruction. And um, yeah, so eventually that took me, led me to become a kind of like a robust metaphysical naturalist, you know, so like a, a more kind of sophisticated atheist version, you know, so not like the new atheists we were just like, ah, religion's delusional and things like that, but more so like following along lines of like Jeff Lauder and, and Paul Draper and these sorts of people that I was really interested in. And so then I was like a committed metaphysical naturalist. And then in like 11th grade, maybe 12th grade, um, you know, I, I, I delved deeper into philosophy of religion and found that things were far more complex than I had, than my ninth and 10th grade self had thought. Uh, and so, you know, I came across like Alexander Proust's work, Josh Rasmussen's work, uh, things like that. And those led me more towards agnosticism. And uh, yeah, so <laughs> that's kind of where I am today as well. So I've persisted in that, that state, um, but I've really refined lots of my views since then so and, and do you think that um that kind of bit because you came out of like a religious belief do you think this motivated then your philosophical study in a way where like i can i can say personally that in a lot of my study i've kind of um wanted to find a type kind of christianity that was true um and that's what i've almost been looking for sometimes when I've, uh, you've kind of froze for me visually, so I don't know if you yeah, you're still there. <laughs> so, you know, like I, sometimes I've um, pushed back on Christians in certain ways, or I've explored certain ideas because I want to f find a kind of Christianity that's true. But in the meantime, I've learned all this philosophy along the way. Is that something similar for you or did it just become philosophy for philosophy's sake almost at a certain point or? That's, that's a great question. So, I'm not quite sure I even have <laughs> epistemic access to my desires in the, in this way. Like, I don't know. I, I don't quite know. Um, you know, like I, I find philosophy boundlessly interesting in itself. Um, and you know, I, I just really like, uh, just intrinsically, uh, learning and, and especially learning about like the fundamental ultimate nature of reality. I'm just kind of interested in like the foundations and ultimate natures of things, you know, things like that. And so, I guess, you know, part of that makes me interested in, in God's existence, but also makes me interested in, you know, like what is time and like what is persistence yeah. and, you know, what, what are these sorts of things? And so there is definitely, at least right now, uh, a kind of intrinsic motivating factor. But I guess extrinsically, I also, you know, like I, I want some kind of, for instance, maybe a, a universalist Christianity be, to be true. Like I want that to be true. I think that's um, a kind of very beautiful worldview. Um, 
and it's very, you know, it's desirable. Like, I think that'd be great for that to be true. Um, but yeah, so that also kind of motivates me and it kind of keeps me in philosophy of religion as well, because I think like, if God does exist, you know, maybe that would be like the ultimate treasure of reality uh, in, in some sense. Um, and so that that's kind of another thing that, you know, like, I don't know, it's kind of like a quest. Like, I want to find out whether or not God exists and, uh, or at least I just want to have a justified belief in this manner or justified credence, uh, I should say. So yeah, I, I guess it's a mixture of both intrinsic factors and extrinsic factors. And have you ever worried from like a, a sort of um, theological point of view, maybe within certain types of Christianity, um, where they say things like, um, you know, you're only going to be able to believe in Christianity by the grace of God alone. And so it might be that actually you're not never going to be able to reason yourself to this. Obviously, not all Christians think in that way. But is that something you've kind of grappled with or worried about um, as someone who wants a type of Christianity to be true, perhaps? That's interesting. Um, I don't think so. Um, I'm not quite worried about those versions of Christianity, mainly because I, I have to be honest, I don't find them like plausible, like intellectually speaking. Like I think that there are certain objections to those uh, those versions, and I, I would I would kind of like prefer maybe a more I don't know if evidentialist is the right approach, but like, you know, like growing up Catholic, like they are, uh, you know, they're pretty em emphatic on like, uh, you know, the, the importance of science and importance of reason. And, um, you know, like, of course, God's grace is working through these sorts of things, but also it's a very, I guess, not rationalist faith, but like there's a good balance between rationalism on the one hand and, um, and like fideism on the other hand there it's like a good balance whereas the 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 versions of christianity that you're spilling out here would kind of fall more onto the fideist side of things and so um i don't really find those all that plausible and so i'm not really too worried about that um yeah yeah so it, within this kind of like um philosophy of religion but i suppose academically and at a popular level landscape over the past um i don't know like 15 or so or so years i can think it's been particularly perhaps in the public eye um it, where do you see yourself as kind of fitting into that story because you've got you know like um people like Richard Dawkins say, who were very popular people like Chris, Christopher Hitchens. Um, and then you've got like a period of time where almost that kind of died down. And then you've got people like maybe Jordan Peterson coming along who are pushing a kind of Christianity. And now it seems to be like a different, um, I don't know what you'd call it, like zeitgeist or cultural meme or something uh, that, that we're kind of participating in now. And how do you see yourself as like fitting into the dialectic there? Yeah, so, um... Like culture, so are you asking kind of like culturally speaking? Um, I, I just want some clarification. Yeah, yeah, of course. So I, so I suppose like um, maybe it might be worth from your point of view to describe how you see that kind of historical process as playing out and leading up to where we're at now, you know, as, as people who are on YouTube having these kind of conversations about philosophy of religion. But then also may, like if, if you were to um, have like a Venn diagram or something, you know, is there somewhere you'd like place yourself? Like, um, I don't know, maybe yeah. there's there's people who are counter apologetics or something, but then there might be people who approach it in one way or for one motivation, another subset who um, approach it for different reasons. Um, and how, how do you view all of that stuff that's going on? Yeah, that's interesting. Well, one fundamental division, and it's unfortunate, you know, to kind of like make divisions because that does kind of, you know, rile up our tribalistic side. But one fundamental division that I see um, in all these debates in the in like within the past 20 years, as you were saying, you know, like with Richard Dawkins, you're kind of giving this sort of more um, cultural slash intellectual side of things, but also on like the YouTube uh, uh, apologetics and counter apologetics scene. One fundamental division that I always see uh, is that between, I don't know, just a, a kind of fundamental and, and genuine just search for truth and, and you know, things like that on the other on the one side, and you know that that'll be uh, people both who are apologists and counter apologists and Christians and non Christians who are who will fall into that camp. And then on the other side, you have the people who are more so kind of just attacking and or attacking and or defending in a more so like weaponized kind of manner. Um, either trying to convince others for the sake of convincing them or getting them within your tribe, and not trying to um, you know like mutually love one another love the truth pursue the truth with one another but more so trying to either attack their positions tear down their positions just bolster um the tribe's beliefs uh things like that so that's kind of the fundamental division that i see uh and and through which the lens through which i kind of view some of these different 
I don't know, uh, aspects of both the culture and, uh, you know, yeah. the YouTube scene. And so that that's really how I see it. And um, like I said, on both of those sides, on, I guess we can say like the truth loving, truth oriented side um, versus the kind of more tribalistic side. Um, on both sides, in this side, there are Christians and atheists. On this side, there are Christians and atheists. And of course, you know, other denominations and other versions and things like that. So um, it, it definitely crosses ideological barriers on both sides. Um, but I think fundamentally, everyone who's on this this truth and love oriented side, they're on the same team ultimately. And um, and what we really need to try to reduce is that that other side where you know it's more focused on tribalism and things like that. So, do do you see like a new um, sort of niche being carved out in that landscape? Because I, I I suppose from from my point of view, um, there's definitely those characters who have been around you know and, and popular over the past ten years or so on on both sides and in, in a more combative sense you might sort of say um there's also um there's people who seem to have been popular popularized over the past four years with with some newer things but then there's there's also people who seem to be more interested in like a, a, an academic philosophy of religion thing which is what i see you being a part of like um figures like alex malpass even some of the stuff um cameron batuzzi is doing with capturing christianity seems to be trying to promote more sort of philosophy of religion type discussion than like the you know the amazing atheist say or matt dillahunty or something like that like that th those seem to be a different um it's almost like a, a, an entirely different species of thing altogether so um is that, that. That something you'd agree with that uh, is that something you're trying to actively do like promote philosophy of religion um with? Yeah. well i definitely see that um and I, I do think i i agree with that like when i watch videos like i can definitely tell which side of of the dichotomy you're speaking on um which side like the the people who are making the video or the video itself would fall on whether or not it's like actually informed by the relevant relevant literature on the topic and philosophy, religion, and things like that versus it's more so this kind of like, just, I don't know, this kind of cesspool of cringe <laughs> that's like, um, uh, that's not informed by uh, the, the more philosophy of religion aspects. And so, yeah, I mean, my channel, I would definitely fall into that kind of, I mean, I, I'm not really trying to popularize philosophy of religion for philosophy's sake, but more mm -hmm. so trying to, I don't know, educate people about philosophy and to think critically, think philosophically, orient themselves towards truth and, and reason and things like that rather than tribalism and, and so on. Um, and I mean, uh, even a lot of like the video topics that I do, some of them are actually kind of just like tangentially related to my ultimate purpose in the video, which is like to help people um, kind of come to grips with and develop uh, certain tools of critical thinking. So like my moral disagreement um, video, like, yeah, I'm interested in moral disagreement and I'm interested in how that interacts with moral realism. Yeah. But like, Ultimately, my purpose is kind of like just to get help, help people be able to evaluate arguments in that. And I want them to see the different dialectical strategies, the different criticisms that you can make, the different like types of arguments, like inference of the best explanation, uh, Bayesian arguments, things like that. Like in, in like my divine foreknowledge video, like I, I, I remember distinctly making that one. I'm like, this really isn't a video about divine foreknowledge. It's about modal transfer or modal scope fallacies. And I just I want to have a backdrop against which I can present these kind of uh, critical thinking tools, but ultimately for a lot of my videos, not all of them, but for a lot of them, I'm like, I'm, my, my purpose is the critical thinking tools. Um, and I, I really want to uh, improve that um, for, for people and, and kind of display that. So. Yes. It's interesting that you say that as well, because in your book, it clearly comes across, you know, how, how much you see um, poor thinking maybe, maybe as being like um, the root cause behind a lot of like tribalism politically or a lot of like, um, discourse that seems to lead to negative outcomes so maybe it's just like being bogged down in pe like a large percentage of the population being stuck at home bogged down in twitter in these like really crappy discussions that go nowhere and nothing but you know you've uh, everyone gets all uh what's the word kind of kind of uh, pent up or whatever as a, as a result of them um uh, and critical thinking tools maybe as being something that might move people away from that kind of dialogue to more productive forms or thinking about these problems in a different way. And um, it's interesting to see that come across in your videos as well. Um, it, I wonder first if you wanna say um, why you think that's so important for overcoming tribalism. But then I also do have a question about, um, so the like people who fall into those kind of tribalistic camps as well, whether you see or understand what they're doing and how you how you think how you'd want to bring them on from that because I think 
maybe I'll leave this question to later because I don't want to um, give you too much to deal with in one go. But if you if you want to like uh, talk talk first about um, the importance of critical thinking for overcoming that tribalism, uh, as you see. Yeah. So I'm going to be honest. Like, I actually think that even more important than these tools of critical thinking um, are intellectual virtues and the kind of more dispositional and and not so much personality, but like dispositional person-based aspects of it. I think those are even probably more important for the pursuit of truth and for the, um, you know, productive exchange and flow of ideas. I view these intellectual and, and moral virtues as more important than that, because those kind of, as I, as I was like pointing out in my book, like those kind of serve as the foundation for your uh, critical thinking tools, right? Like, you can have all the critical thinking tools in the world, but if you don't have these intellectual virtues that are undergirding them, like um, you know, like open mindedness and uh, charity and things like that, if you don't have those undergirding your critical thinking tools, you're just going to use those critical thinking tools. You're going to not actually use uh, use them. You're going to abuse them, and you're just going to use them to um, you know propagate your own kind of tribe and things like that. So it's like without these these kind of dispositions, these good habits of of mind and heart with these moral virtues intellectual virtues without those like you're you're, you're totally foundationless and your, your critical thinking tools won't really mean all that much they won't serve people they won't serve you they won't be oriented towards the truth because i view virtues mainly as like things that are kind of orienting you they orient you towards the good in the case of moral virtues and the true in the case of the intellectual virtues um you know or weeding out falsehoods. And so, you know, like, what do these look like? Well, like intellectual perseverance. So like, not just reading one article and then thinking everything is solved on the basis of that, like intellectual perseverance, really trying to get to the bottom of things, um, you know, intellectual curiosity. So don't just like, not even care about these deep issues, but instead be be curious about them, be curious about whether or not your current beliefs are true and things like that, you know, open mindedness, um, uh, you know, things like that. And so that's what helps orient you towards the truth. And it's that in conjunction with the critical thinking tools uh, that will really help you get to the uh, get to the truth. And ultimately, that's kind of, you know, the, the treasure. That's really what we're after, I think. Um, so th I see the virtues actually as more important than the critical thinking tools. They are important, but uh, I see them as less important than the virtues. Yeah. I, so, so the second part of the question that um, I was asking, but I didn't want like to give you a bunch of stuff to think about, so you couldn't like adequately respond to the first one. But it is so. Where, sometimes I find when people um, have like um, perhaps been pushed or um, pushed themselves into one of these more tribal groups, sometimes that's a result of them directly being um, hurt by some of the ideas that are out there. So maybe politically or specifically in the case of religion, people who have been in like um, more cult type environments where um, harmful attitudes have affected the way that they're able to live their life and stuff like that. And, it, and sometimes in a sense, sometimes I can be sympathetic towards that approach because I see it as combating um, combating something that that's harmful in an effective way maybe yeah. where where yeah. talking about these ideas at the at like an intellectual level is, is important but it might not have that same effect and i wondered if if i don't know if how you think you deal with that because obviously i don't think it's a good thing that there's like this um this culture wars battle going on at one level but also i acknowledge that um you know, not everyone is is in the game to play nicely in that way, so to speak. You know, there there are people um, with like white supremacy ideas, say, out there who aren't yeah. interested in developing these like intellectual virtues. Do you have any ideas about how we should deal with those things as, as like you know, as as content create creators, as um as people who can kind of like see this and are saying we've got some tools that help people. How like do you? How, how do you go about getting that out there? Is this too weird of a question for you to be able to answer just off the cuff? Like, no, I, I like it. I mean, um, I mean, what I want to say is like exposure. So th th I think that's my, 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 my big answer is exposure. Like, um, you know, when, when you're talking about, uh, for instance, people who have these very toxic belief systems, you know, things like uh, that might be more cult like as you, you, you mentioned white supremacy, things like that, Nazism and, and so on like the best or at least from what i've heard like you know i know there's a ted talk on this where um it's this um uh uh it's a it's a black man and he uh he like went to or he like made 
he he made like best friends with a bunch of clan members and he got them to hang up their robes and to get <laughs> to like refuse to be racist and you know and to change their lives because they were exposed to him they were exposed to his humanity they were exposed to um you know him as a person and it's this kind of exposure i think um that that helps people overcome those kind of more cult-like, more insular, more isolated, um, us versus them, in versus out kind of mindsets. It's, I, so I think the answer is really exposure. It's to expose people to the other side, um, the other side, right? It's, a, it's to expose people <laughs> to the humanity of them, but also, I guess, the ration, I guess how someone could rationally see things their way. Um, so ultimately, I think exposure is probably the best. And that helps them perspective take, you know, that's that's something that's big in the psychological literature, um, not because it's like pop, but because it actually works. There's actually scientific evidence behind uh, this kind of perspective taking thing. Um, and so, yeah, exposure, that, that's my big answer. Um, I think that's a way to um, proceed with people who might be more kind of ideologically rooted and things like that. Now, how do we on a, that'll how do we like expose them to these sorts of things that'll probably be on a case-by-case -case basis you know I, I don't know like i can just put out the content and hope it I, hope, it I hope people them. pick it up and, and yeah. enact it in some way or yeah 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 I, I sometimes i think and i don't i don't know if you have had similar thoughts on this sometimes like um i see someone like darth dawkins talk to like tjip for example and i i think like well in, in a way that's like a match made in heaven right and it's like like it's like that that's almost um that type of dialogue like tom's really really effective at like dealing with a t-jump but then i watch like i'm um, say you talk to t-jump and i'm like oh no we're not like getting the best out of the ideas here that could be kind of got out of them because of this like dialectic style and stuff and, and so i personally do have a hard time like like um passing up the landscape and it, like like as, as an individual who's like what am i going to consume what am i going to watch what ideas am i going to adopt i'm like well uh, at one level um you know like I'm, I'm entertained by darth dawkins getting like intellectually like beat up in a, in a debate or whatever but then at another level i'm like is this like the best use of my time how is this changing my character like engaging in this or I, um so it's it's interesting to hear hear how you're you're thinking about these things. I, I wondered, um, do do you have any thoughts about your discussion with uh, Tom specifically, um, on how that went? Because that was quite a strange sort of yeah. <laughs> and you can be difficult to uh, dialogue with on. Yeah, um, it was difficult. Uh, it was very difficult. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it was just difficult. I feel like maybe there were some barriers. Like, I, I wish I, I don't know, if I could like write up my thoughts, it'd be probably better. Um, Have but... you watched it back, the video, since it happened? Oh, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Um, but uh, yeah, so it, it was rough. Um, I mean, I ultimately, I, I think it was good. I, I mean, I think I, well, I, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> so let's see. Well, one thing that I just uh, ultimately, uh, ultimately I'm really frustrated about is um, just his conception of evidence and how it relates to confirmation within philosophy of science. Uh, it just seems to me that uh, what he says is at very, very, very strong odds with uh, what we know from uh, philosophy of science and even scientific inquiry um, concerning how um, the old evidence, so old evidence doesn't mean something that like, oh, we acquired this 200 years ago. Like old evidence just means evidence or some kind of fact or data that we already know about, we've already uncovered, say. Um, old evidence actually can play a very significant role in providing evidential confirmation for different theories. Um, you know, you have this with like the retrograde motion of, uh, what was it, like the planets, and, and you also have the perihelion of Mercury and other sorts of things which were already known evidence, which new theories can, um, accommodate, subsume, better explain than all their rival theories and thereby gain evidential confirmation on the basis of them. And so, uh, and he was just like denying that. And I just found it very difficult and implausible. And, um, but I think what, what, what was difficult. Um, so I watched it two times. The, f the first time I watched it, and this is a phenomena that I've noticed though. The first time I watched, watched it and I was in the chat, I've noticed this like, a um, like mob mentality effect in the, in those um, comments, uh, ch live chat sometimes. So like when, uh, 
when Bernardo Castro was on, for example, I saw all these comments that were like, blah, 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 I heard all this crap before, therefore God exists. Don't want it. It's like Bernardo Castro isn't arguing for like Christian theism. You just assume, and the, but the same thing happened with you as well. And that's when I, start, I started noticing in the chat, hang on, this is like, there's like a mob mentality jump on thing. It was like, oh, I heard all these arguments for God before, don't need it. Yeah. And it was like, Joe's not even arguing for God's existence. I know. <laughs> I'm like, and, I'm not, I don't even believe, I don't even affirm like these sorts of things. I noticed that as well. And like, um, yeah, th that was also something, but I don't know. I, I, I didn't, it didn't really bother me too much. Those, some of those comments, because I'm just like, you guys are so far removed from reality that it, I just like, I just almost laugh at that point. But, um, but yeah, uh, I think part I, of the I, issue is though, to, like Tom seems to have these kind of like go-to lines and things that come out about, so you like, you raised a point, I think about, um, like using Bayesian reasoning. And he said, well, the problem with that is it's like a map and a territory fallacy or something. Or a and I remember being like, like, hang on, like this, this doesn't even have anything to do with what Joe just yeah. said, but he says it with such confidence and moves so fast through these that's points. What, that's what bothered me so much. Um, with the sheer I don't think you picked him up on it because it, because he was so confident. I think you just like took it for granted that it must have been true what he said. And I was like, hang on, we just yeah, like, like, we just were going, you. Like, well, exactly. I mean, most of the time, like he would throw out like three different statements and like, I would want, like I, I, would, I wanted to say like, listen, I can make like a three hour video on one of those statements showing why. <laughs> it's contrary to like everything in philosophy of science. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It, it was just difficult. Um, like I, I appreciate that he's there and, and, you know, he's, he's searching for truth and, and he's having people on. And so I really appreciate both. And he has some really good points as well. I yeah. Think. Well, I, I appreciate and, and love what, what he's doing and him as a person and things like that. Um, but it wasn't just a rough conversation at points, at least, um, precisely for some of these reasons that we're talking about and the sheer confidence with which um, some of the things were said uh, and, you know, just like proclaiming these things, which like most scientists and philosophers of science would take as just completely mistaken, you know, for instance, concerning old evidence and, and so on. And also uh, just, just some really implausible things like, you know, his, his criterion of distinguishing between imagination and reality, like, um, that would entail that we simply don't know that we're not brains and vats or that we don't know that we're not in the matrix and so on, because there's no way in principle to distinguish between phenomenologically between that's what we learn from these skeptical scenarios. There's no way in principle to distinguish phenomenologically between imagination and reality in such scenarios. And so per his own criterion, we're, we're cast into radical skepticism. And uh, I take that radical skepticism is false. And so we have to reject his criterion. Um, and then he went on about like proposing some hypothesis first and it was it was just difficult. But I, I wonder, is there anything you think from having these YouTube discussions um, that the sort of ac academia could benefit from? And then I'll ask the converse question afterwards, what do you think these YouTube conversations could benefit from that you see in academia that is kind of lacking? Um, because they're both different environments, there's different personalities, different types of dialogue that go on. Um, and so I guess you, you'd be able to see, oh, this thing is here that's really valuable, but isn't here. Um, and, and what is that? Um, what's that in academia for you that does exist in YouTube, if, if there is uh, something? That is a good question. Um, well, you know, I, this will probably just, it sounds like a textbook answer, but I mean, it's true. Um, just, you know, a lot of academia is inaccessible and a lot of it is genuinely just, you know, bundled up in the ivory tower and the only people who can access it are people who have like PhDs in philosophy who can even understand it. And so there's this big barrier between, um, I guess, what what internet, uh, what internet dialogues and, and YouTube can convey and on the one hand and what is actually happening in academia on the other hand. So there's this big language barrier, technicality barrier, um, prior knowledge barrier, and so that, I, I don't know, that's the biggest thing. And so what we really need is somehow, and well, not somehow, but we need people to be able to um, convey a lot of, lots of the ideas within academia uh, and break them down, make them more accessible at least, um, and make them less technical and, and so on. And so like, you know, I try to do that in a lot of my videos, even though, uh, you know, a lot of people say that my videos are very, very technical, but um, I try, I try, <laughs> I try people. Um, but you know, like people coming on Capturing Christianity, people coming on your channel and breaking these things down, simplifying them, um, that's really valuable. That's what we need more of probably. Um, but that's the, probably the biggest thing. And then as contrary wise as to what academia could use that is present on YouTube and other social media things, 
That's interesting. Um, what do you think? Um, I mean, I've, I've often thought like, like when I read, um, like the history of philosophy and stuff, I, I always think it's interesting in like the, the medieval period, like the disputation method I always think about where I, I always hear about like, um, professors would say like pick someone with a position and get them to like argue the opposite of what they wanted using like th this particular method. And then, um, after a while that they commit, I, I think it'd be, I mean, some people have played around with this sort of idea. I think, did, did you do one with Randall Rouse? I can't remember. Someone did yes. one. Yes. Where, where you like, oh, the devil's advocate debate I did with him. Mm -hmm. And I, I think seeing more of those sorts of things would be cool. And I, I even thought um, when I saw Josh Rasmussen's uh, worldview design, I saw a couple of his um, videos on like building a worldview. And I thought I, I should do this with myself. Like I, sh I should look at, um, videos I've got where I'm criticizing cr uh, Christianity, say, um, and and really pick at where I say stupid things, where I like um, skip over problems in my in my thinking, and I'm like, well, that doesn't actually quite follow from that. Like, I'm just saying stuff there, but it's actually really unasserted. And how how would I argue for the opposite point of view? I think it'd be cool to see more of that. Um, yeah, I, I guess the difficulty. Yeah, sorry, you got you. No, I mean that is interesting. I mean, you know, like. Hmm. But I don't know. I don't know how much of that goes on in academia because um, yeah, no, no, not much. Yeah. Like, 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 I mean, there's, you know, academia, like we, like, like medieval people, academia. Ah, uh, no. Okay. Yeah, there, there are people as well, and so they're like attached to their own positions. You know, you'll get one author defending the single position for like maybe even decades, yeah. say, um, and like they'll never publish anything uh, critiquing it, and so on. You know, like it'd be interesting to see, like. I don't know, more exploratory papers where you're not necessarily agreeing with something and you're kind of just, I mean, that's not to say that it's absent. I mean, there are some of those, but um, it'd be interesting to see more of that. So um, yeah, that, that'd be interesting. That's a good suggestion. Yeah, I I think I think another problem for the YouTube platform in general is just like, um, like almost how it works. Like you've got to, you've got to adopt, if, if you want to like um, grow a channel or support like a successful channel, so you've got to like do certain things which can also feel like, um, uh, a bit, I don't know. Like you've got, you've got to play the game in a way that is, you know, like clickbaity kind of titles and uh, <laughs> Peru, drama, Peru yeah. for daughter, you know, things like that. Yeah, uh, and that that kind of stuff can be generally just unhelpful to like, like you know, you almost you're almost naturally forming like cliques and tribes around like who yep. subscribed to certain channels and things that, uh, exactly. and that can be difficult to get out of. Um, so. Something else I wanted to it talk to possible. you about. Well, right, right before you say that, it is possible to resist that. I know it's hard, but it's like, if you want to grow, you probably have to do it, but it is possible to resist it. Um, I've had to resort, like, occasionally to some kinds of, like, very minimally clickbaity things, but not really. Like, I try to make my, like, titles, like, Aquinas' first way and analysis. You know, like, <laughs> or, like, Aquinas' third way and analysis. But, like, I try, like, at the beginning of my channel, I was like, I'm not going to make this, like four people debunked, you know, like, I'm, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I told myself, I'm like, Joe, you're not going to do this. Um, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, like, it's possible to avoid it. But that one, if I made a video, if I like made a video, and I said, like, someone debunked in all caps or something, yeah. my sad guess is that it would get like more clicks, <laughs> and more, more viewers than I normally get. But, um, you know, tis the nature of clickbait. But I'm, I'm sticking with my guns so far. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I, th I think I think it's working. Like like I said, I, th I think what you are doing is sort of carving out a a, a bit of a space for um, people who want to think this way and stuff. And it, it 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 ripples out and changes how the landscape kind of looks, which is that's, good. that's good. I like I, I like how you said that. Like someone someone brought that up to me when I was like complaining about something um, to <laughs> to someone else, and they were like, "Well, like listen, like even if your channel stays at like under." let's say 3k for a long while, like that's mainly because like you've got, like you're concentrating your viewership to some pretty like, like philosophy PhDs and grad students. Like I have lots of grad students that email me and they're like, Hey dude, I love your videos. I, I you know, like I share them with my grad student friends and you know, like things like that. And so like, I, you know, people have, people have told me like, well, Hey, like, listen, if you have like 70,000 followers, like like a lot of times, unfortunately, many of those are, are going to be kind of trying to form this kind of tribalistic more so thing. Uh, that's not to say that's always going to happen, but sometimes that is going to happen. And it's probably more likely if you have these kind of 70,000, 80,000, 200,000, a million, you know, um, whereas if you're just concentrating it on this very low kind of niche sort of thing, 
arguably you're creating a community where it's, I don't know, it's much more, it's much higher quality. Uh, there's less tribalism, uh, at least hopefully. Um, yeah. So like, I, I, I agree with you there. It's almost like, it's like creating a niche. It's creating a niche where you can raise a level of discourse and um, yeah, just have, have respect for everyone on all sides, really. Yeah. So, so um, something I also wanted to talk to you about is, so you um, describe yourself as an agnostic and you've got a big video on this. What does it mean to be an agnostic from your point of view? And then maybe we'll talk about some of the other terms that people might use to describe themselves and why they might use them, what they mean, what's the appropriate kind of um, way of, uh, of passing up these different positions that people might take. Yeah. So uh, we need to start this with a uh, distinction between belief and credence. Okay. So um, we're getting fancy here, but belief, belief is like an on or off switch, right? You either believe something or you don't believe it. Um, uh, now, of course, there, you know, there are minor nuances like believing the negation of something, but uh, in general, for any proposition P, you either believe it or you don't believe it. It's an on or off switch. That's important. Whereas credence, okay, what is credence? Credence just means like your level of confidence in something, your level of confidence. So for instance, uh, maybe you think that the, the weatherman is quite, or the weather person, I should, probably should be inclusive. If you think that the weather person is quite reliable, um, you know what, let's go with weather woman, wonder woman. No, we're going with weather woman. So what, what if I'm a man and I want to be a weatherman? So, <laughs> no, so okay, the weather person, you think that the weather yeah. person is quite reliable. If you, you know, you have a justified belief in their being reliable and they say there's a 70% chance of rain, likely you're going to say something like, well, my level of confidence in the proposition that it will rain, say today, let's just choose that day. Um, my level of confidence is 70%. Like you don't like full blow. It's not like an on or off thing in this case. It's a level of confidence. And so you have a spectrum here. You can be, for instance, 100% confident that uh, your parents love you. You can be 90% confident that you'll get an A in this particular class because you only have two assignments left and you you know, you know, you think you knocked out of the park on one of them. Uh, you know, you, you can be 90% confident. Maybe you can be 50% confident if I like flip a coin and I don't tell you and you're just like, <laughs> I don't know, like 50% confidence is heads, 50% confidence in its tails. Um, maybe uh, you're 0% confident in something. So that means you you are 100% confident in its negation, right? So if you're 0% confident in something, that means you're 100% confident that it's false. So, um, you know, like I'm 100% confident that, um, let's say one is identical to one or something, you know? Um, so that's credence, it's level or degree of confidence. And uh, the relationship between belief and credence is really interesting and there's a huge literature there, but, um, for now, I'm just going to stick with credence because I like talking about credences. We can, you know, we can be a little bit more precise. Um, that's not okay. to say you can say like I'm 72.4% comp. Like that, usually that's not going to work, but you can still say things like plus or minus. You know, like roughly half and half, more likely than false, 100%. You know, like things like that. So, with that distinction in hand, and with our principal focus on uh, the credence side of things, the level of confidence side of things. I roughly break down agnostics into three kinds of categories. So one is an epistemic agnostic. That's what I fall into. Um, they do say that there is indeed, um, well, they take a stance on the probability that God exists. So that's our proposition. That's going to be our proposition that we're going to assign credences to. So they do take a stance on that and they do take a stance on the probability. And they say from their perspective, having evaluated the evidence and things like that, they think it's roughly halfly half and half. It's roughly 50% probable that God exists. Um, also 50% probable that God doesn't exist, of course. So that's what that's what an epistemic agnostic is going to say. They're going to take a stance on the probability because they've evaluated the evidence, and then they're going to say it's roughly half and half because the evidence roughly counterbalances. That's what they're going to say. That's an epistemic agnostic. Second kind of an agnostic is an in-principle agnostic. So an in-principle agnostic says it's impossible to know either way whether or not God exists. So they don't even assign a, like a they're not going to assign a credence. They're just going to say, it's impossible to know. Like, what are you doing assigning these credences? Like, this is either beyond our cognitive grasp or, you know. So that's an in-principle agnostic. It's, it's in-principle impossible to know uh, whether or not God exists. That's the second kind. The third kind is, I'm forgetting the name, um, is, oh, no, I call it a suspension agnostic. So suspension agnostic they don't maintain that it's in principle impossible to know. So they say, for all for all I know, yeah, it is in principle possible to know. But they just say, I'm just going to suspend assigning a probability altogether. So they don't say it's like half and half. They're just like, I'm not, I'm not even going to put the pin anywhere, right? <laughs> Zero to 100, I'm not putting the pin. I'm just going to refrain. Um, maybe because I haven't evaluated it, the evidence in enough detail. Maybe because... Um, 
Who knows? There might be different reasons, but that's a suspension agnostic. So I fall into that first category, an epistemic agnostic. Um, so that's what agnosticism means to me. Uh, and hopefully that was uh, illuminating. Now, I don't know if you had any other any other questions. That well, well, so for, for the other um, words that people um, play around with, atheism and theism then, would you similarly use the same sort of three categories um, applied to those terms? Or um, is there something different that you do with, the, with those? Yeah, so... Atheism and theism. So I like to, again, we're going to speak in terms of credence because I think that's much clearer than belief because belief is, is really fuzzy. Like when do I get, like if I think it's 70% probable that, that, that it will rain, do I believe it will rain? I mean, yeah, I see what you mean. It's like, it's like your belief is kind of binary in that sense. Yeah. Is it, it? I, I tend to think that credences are, are perhaps more fundamental. Like, um, credence is, in some sense, once you have the credences fixed, then your beliefs are fixed. Once you have those credences, like maybe it's something like 80% and over where that's the cutoff for belief. And then between like 20% to 80%, you have to like, maybe I slightly lean towards it or, you know, things like that. And then, yeah. So, but, but my point is like belief is really, really fuzzy. And, um, I, that's why I like to talk in terms of credences. It's much more precise. It's not fuzzy. It gives you it, it precisely locates you like how confident you are and, and what evidence you have and things like that. So with our credence talk, I would say that an, like an atheist would be someone who um, thinks that the proposition that God does not exist maybe has something like between 80% to 100%, you know, probability that that's true, that God doesn't exist. So they would be something like, like either 80% confident or 85 or 90 and so on. Um, uh, then a, a theist would be, um, with respect to the proposition that God does exist, they would say something like 80% to 100% there. So they're, they're like at the opposite ends of the spectrum. And then in between those, and again, these are kind of, you know, we can debate about where to put that, that little, um, that little edge, that little boundary, uh, 80%, maybe it's 75, maybe it's 85. Um, that's not really important for present purposes. We just need a rough characterization, a rough sketch. Um, after all, these things are going to be probably vague at some point. Um, so that, that's kind of the characterization of theist and atheist. And then you can have people who like lean towards one way or another. So like maybe someone who is an agnostic atheist, that would just be someone who has a credence of less than 0.8, as I characterized it, towards the proposition that God doesn't exist. They have less than 0.8, so they don't full-blown believe. But they like lean towards it because they're an agnostic atheist. So like they would, they'd like, maybe they'd have a 65% confidence. Like, hey, like it's not half and half. Like maybe I have some really good problems of evil to run, but you know, maybe this fine tuning is still pulling me away and not making me go past 80% say. So they maybe have 65, 70% confidence. And so it doesn't really make sense to say that they believe that God doesn't exist. Um, but also they're not really an agnostic in the sense of like, in the senses that I defined it. Um, this is why I like the kind of credence terms because we can like deal away with agnostic. We, I mean, terminology like that's an e that's a useful heuristic, but fundamentally I would just like to ask like, okay, you think it's 65% probable. Why do you think that? So give me some reasons that pull you towards theism and then give me some reasons to pull you towards atheism. Show me why these atheist ones are stronger than the other ones, but not sufficiently strong so as to warrant um, higher credence, you know? So um, that's a long winded way of going about <laughs> answering your question. But I do, think it, I do think it's a much more precise um, and much more, um, yeah, it, it's a better way to look at things in my view. So, so there's some sort of weird, well, I say, I say weird, but it could be even um, like approaching a majority on some sides. So, so within both like um, people who would want to call themselves theists and people who would want to call themselves atheists, there's some sort of um, cases where it'd be interesting to see how you'd place them then on this like classification system. So if someone's saying that, they, that they're an atheist, but by which they mean they lack a belief in God, and that's quite a lot of people, how would your like classification system um, deal with that? Because they're not, to me, it doesn't seem like someone who says they lack a belief of, in God is like placing a credence on the idea that um, there is no God as part of how they define themselves. Or I don't know, maybe you've got thoughts on that. Yeah, so I would like, again, this is gonna be, well, first of all, I should say, so, oh no. Okay, I'm back. Yeah, you're back. <laughs> okay, I froze. <laughs> okay, I froze for a second. Um, so first I should say, like, I don't claim that everyone ought to or should accept this kind of classification scheme. This is how I understand things. This is how I make sense of things. So um, yeah, this is, and I th just think it's a really clear, precise way to go about things. And it's kind of how, 
this is how well I, I like Bayesian approaches in in epistemology and in philosophy of religion. You know, a la Paul Draper, Trent Doherty, Richard Swinburne, and a whole host of other philosophers, including like Alex Proust and so on. So uh, a, a kind of Bayesian way of casting this is the way that I, I I do it, and like roughly. And so, but but I don't claim that this is like the way it ought to or should be. Do, like after all, these are classification schemes, and I mean like they're kind of constructed, you know, like I'm not really carving reality at its joints as to like, we're just, we're doing, we're defining things, right? So um, this is my classification scheme. I don't claim that everyone ought to or should or must accept it. I just think it's, hey, this is what I'm going to use. It's really precise. It's really, uh, really clear. And it's what a lot of philosophers use. So uh, with that out of the way, that caveat, um, for this person who is, you know, this hypothetical person who would say that they lack a belief, I would just ask them, well, and again, this is going to be a case by case basis. How confident are you that God does not exist? Or how confident are you that God exists? So let's take the proposition. Let's take the evidence that you know of. Maybe you maybe you think that the problem of evil or the problem of animal suffering is really powerful. Maybe you think that um, contingency arguments pull you slightly one way. Uh, and then I'd ask him, how confident roughly? And so you just give me something that's really rough. Um, how confident are you? And then they'd tell me, um, well, uh, maybe I'm like 70%. Well, that that's kind of... I mean, for me, that's kind of like end of story. Okay, interesting. Maybe we can call you an agnostic atheist. I don't really care about that. I, what I care about is the credence and why you believe what you do. So it's a credence-based approach. And it, I really also would just like to focus on the reasons that they have for and against um, uh, atheism. I mean, you know, the lack... When people say that they lack a belief in God, oftentimes you'll see in their videos, they're like offering, they'll say omnipotence is incoherent and then they'll go on to like offer some kind of problem of evil and, and so on. So like they do take stances on these sorts of things. And oftentimes they, they do in fact have a pretty high degree of confidence that God does not exist. Um, so, but it's mainly, I would just try to focus on the credence things, the credences uh, in the situation. And I don't really care too much about labels that much. Um, like they can call themselves an atheist if they lack belief. Um, like, okay, uh, let's just talk. About, if you're going to talk with me, let's just talk with credence. So how confident are you and why? That, 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 those are my two questions. I wonder on the other side for like someone who's a fideist, if they are saying, you know, like, I, I don't know what credence they'd give any of the arguments, if they'd even be giving like a, you know, some kind of saying, oh, well, I think this uh, this reason for God's existence succeeds to like 70% or something, 70% confident. Um, I don't know if they'd want to say that, but they, uh, and you might dis disagree on that, but they, they'd want to say they're a theist. Does that, does your definition kind of encompass or take into account that sort of so thing? That's, an interesting, that's interesting because the way that I have been sketching this, it's kind of like an evidentialist, <laughs> It's kind of like an evidentialist based approach. Like as I was, I was just mentioning like Swinburne and Doherty and Draper, like these are evidentialist philosophers. So um, yeah, I mean, like, so I, I think what you're getting at is like, well, someone might be like 100% confident in their belief, but like they recognize that like reason itself wouldn't bring them to that. Rather, they might be presupposing it or maybe um, they're a fideist. So like, that is an interesting case. Um, and we might be able to distinguish then between um, maybe like a doxastic credence in it. So like, like what, or maybe, okay, I'll, I'll say psychological credence in it. Like what they themselves psychologically, uh, <laughs> assert the probability. So like they would say 100%, but then we could ask them, okay, setting that aside, I recognize that you have 100%. Now let's talk about maybe an epistemic credence. So that's when we were talking about the, or we can call it an evidentialist credence or whatever we want. And when we do that, well, then they might say 50, 50 or something like that. Cause you know, they're, they're the fides. They're not going to, um, or maybe they'll suspend. Maybe they won't say anything on that. Um, but right. psychological credence side, they'll put 100. And then on the evidential credence side, um, who knows what they'll put. So, you, you know, we can make distinctions here. And that, you know, helps helps even further with clarity and precision and so on. So, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, thanks for answering that. So um, I've got some questions from the chat. If you've got, I don't know how much time you've got as well to be um, sticking around. I, um, I like 10 more minutes, 15 maybe. Yeah. Cool, that sounds good. Um, so let me just, I don't know where the first point was someone tagged me in, but I think this is the first one I, I'm coming to anyway. Um, so uh, I'm not, what have to do, uh, what oh, yeah, does what your you have to do in order to determine the, the precise probability? So that's a great question. Um, so I think that um, this is, it's not like, uh, well, it depends. It depends. That, that That's really the answer. So um, philosophers of religion, when they're doing this, um, usually what they do is they take a particular proposition, they uh, sort of give background evidence that they're taking into account, 
and then they give the hypotheses on offer. And then they do their Bayesian analysis where you plug in the expectations of the of the evidence given the hypothesis and the background knowledge, and you can actually work out, you know, using Bayes' theorem, the precise probability that you should assign. Now, it becomes difficult when, when you're doing that across multiple different arguments in multiple different domains within the philosophy of religion, right? Because you'd have to do like that separate assignment for the contingency argument, and then <laughs> Aquinas the first way, and then, <laughs> then the, and, and no one has the time to do that. So that's what makes it, that's what makes it difficult. And so I just say um, a rough assessment, like, um, like we can think about it in terms of betting behavior, right? So like, um, if I asked you to bet on God's existence, um, like, uh, like, okay, so like zero to 100 and, you know, like we can set up the bet in such a way as like, would you bet $60 for this to be true? Or would you bet $70 for this to be true to get like, to get back some amount, you know? So the betting behavior is one way to do it. Um, it's not a perfect way, but like you can ask someone, how much would you bet uh, on, on God's existing given that I'm going to pay you like back this much say, and that'll tell, that'll, t usually that'll tell you if they're not a suspension agnostic or things like that, usually that'll tell you how confident they are, but how do they go about justifying that confidence. Well, then you look at their reasons. They're going to say, listen, based on these reasons, I might have 10 reasons over here, four reasons over here. Some of these are very plausible. Some of these are very plausible. Then they might just say like, listen, I lean more towards this way. And um, because of that, I'm just going to give like an 80%. Like, again, this isn't, this isn't super duper precise. It's precise when you get to the particular arguments, right? Like the fine tuning argument, things like that, because then you have your defined hypotheses, you have your defined evidence and you've your defined background knowledge. And, and with those, you can as well as like the expectation of the evidence given the hypotheses. Once you have those, you can get the very precise number uh, with respect to that particular argument. But like I said, going across these different arguments, uh, ultimately it's it's gonna be more so at like a really rough sketch of, of how confident you are. Um, and you just look at your total reasons, your total evidence base, um, and yeah, on the basis of that you make a rough approximate assessment. And I think, you know, a lot of people would be able to do that. Like if you're saying like, just give me some kind of 10%, you know, like, so 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, like a lot of people might be able to do that. Like it's, it's yeah. <laughs> so that's a, it's a long winded way, but that's how I do it. But have you, I mean, I mean, I've, I've not said this way. Asked, like, have you read much up on, on why it would be that asking people to like gamble on these things would be something that like helps people's reasoning in assessing their own uh, credences. So like, you know, like if you said, well, if you were to put like uh, sixty dollars down on this at these odds or whatever, would it? Is it because because I was thinking about this as you were saying it? Like if it, on so, some of these arguments, I'd find it really difficult to assess how much I think they succeed. But then if you asked me to like put money down on it, and there was going to be an out answer that came out at the end, like yeah. I for, for whatever reason, I'm like, oh yeah, like I, I'd put five pounds down on that, but it was the five dollars, but I wouldn't put sixty dollars on it, you know. Um, yeah, well, and, and what what you're pointing to is like this is why this approach is limited in some regards, right? Because sometimes, like you don't, sometimes you don't know what to make of an argument, and so you like you don't know, you don't have a precise, you know, like maybe you slightly lean towards thinking it's interesting, or like you know, like that's why. Like, you know, humans are so complex and dynamic and things like that. So this won't be able to solve all your problems <laughs> and anything like that. And there will be, there will be lots of fuzz <laughs> in this. Right. And there will be lots of cases where um, you can't really assign a very precise sort of thing. Um, and so the, I, I use it as a useful heuristic for, for categorizing things like that. And it, it, for some arguments, like you said, betting behavior won't really capture your view towards them. Um, you know, so yeah, there are a lot of limitations on this, and you know, uh, it's not like um, it's not like this silver bullet or magic bullet that solves everything. Um, but like I said, I just use this as a very useful way that's oftentimes quite clear and precise. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just a useful heuristic. And um, yeah, and we can get on perfectly well in certain contexts without like invoking this at every step. You know, like um, in most of my videos, I don't even mention this sort of stuff. And like you know, you don't need to do it in Anyway, so the next question, uh, you're talking a lot about percentages. Does Joe know about Richards J. Hoyers, uh, ACH, how, how, Hoyers, how, I, I don't even know, um, ACH, analysis of competing hypotheses? I'm gonna have to look into that. That's interesting. I haven't, I haven't researched that much. So I'll, I'll like, I'm, I'm making a mental note right now and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna look that up. Uh, the next question, question for Joe, does a priori feature in your position and other positions regarding belief in God? Or a priori, a priori, however. Everyone's it differently. Everyone does. <laughs> so like, 
Um, when I learned it a long while back, I was like, I think it was a priori. Uh, that's how I, I learned it from the comics. So that is going to be, I, I, I'm not like, <laughs> I'm not, uh, domineering on this. I'm not, um, <laughs> what's, I don't, I don't it, sure. on some cases I do insist that like, no, you has it, but like prima facie, like prima facie, I say prima facie, like I don't insist, like <laughs> just, just don't go after me. Like in these pronunciations, that's what I say. Um, so yeah, so the a priori or the a priori or whatever, um, I'm guessing that this individual means um, like a priori arguments, right? Like so, like Anselm's ontological argument, or maybe like incoherent properties type arguments, um, concepts, or like a priori. I, I don't know how. Yeah, because it might mean it in like the broadest sense of like that. You know, like a rationalist or innateist versus like a empiricist distinction, maybe um, in terms of building up a philosophy. Interesting. Or, I, I don't know, like, because well, it, 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 regarding belief in God. Well, okay, so right, here's, yeah. here's how I'm going to take this. I'm going to take this as um, what role do I assign to more like armchair arguments and like um, yeah, and like a priori arguments for and against the existence of God? Like, what role do I? What role do those play in my assessment and my my view? Well, um, th I, I'm a kind of particularist on that. I go on a case by case approach. So I, I look at the argument. I see whether or not. I think it's plausible it succeeds, whether or not it has objections, I look at the literature and so on, and then I form an assessment on that basis. So I'm not one of those people who are like, nope, all those a priori arguments are bullshit, get rid of those, <laughs> you know, like, nope, uh, that's not me. Uh, but also like, I don't like privilege these things above all else, you know, it's like, uh, I just, I'm a particularist on this. I, I take the I take argument case by case approach. Awesome. Uh, so, do you have any thoughts on how Richard Carrier uses Bayesian uh, reasoning to show that Jesus did not exist? Uh, well, whether or not he uses Bayesian reasoning or ab abuses it is a different question. <laughs> um, so I think that, okay, I'm just going to lay my cards on the table. I think that Jesus' mythicism is false. I think it is close to a conspiracy theory. Um, uh, it's not really taken seriously by... Uh, most scholars in the relevant fields. Um, uh, so, like, again, you can use uh, Bayesianism in different ways, but the problem is not with Bayesianism if you come to come to these false conclusions. The problem is either with your prior probabilities or the expectabilities that you've assigned or something like that, or maybe you've neglected certain pieces of evidence, which I think is the case with, with Richard Carrier. But anyway, um, yeah, so th that that's my view. <laughs> Uh, Nathan, I believe that Bayesian theory, that is the problem of priors. How does Joe solve that problem in the case we got? That is a problem. Yes. Um, now the liturgy here is just monumental. It's super duper vast. Uh, so I can't even, I can't even begin to gloss it <laughs> right now, but, uh, that is a, that is definitely a problem. Now, what I will say is that oftentimes in arguments, what you're doing is you're actually just looking at the Bayes factor, right? So the Bayes factor Okay, so the odds form of Bayes' theorem, which is like my favorite form, it's really, it's pretty simple, right? You just have the kind of two multiplicands or whatever, the things that you multiply. Uh, the first thing is the Bayes factor. So the Bayes factor is just um, the expectability of the evidence given the first hypothesis divided by the expectability of the evidence given the second hypothesis. So um, if it's more expected on one hypothesis than on the other, then that'll be like top heavy, say, and then it would be... Yeah provide evidence for that hypothesis, vis-a-vis -vis this other hypothesis. And then you have this other this other factor, which is the priors, is the ratio of the priors, right, of the two hypotheses in question. Oftentimes, in Bayesian arguments, and in the ones that I'm usually interested in, you can actually just focus on, I think this one was the one that I was talking about, you can just focus on the base factor, because um, what you can do with the base factor is like, Oftentimes in some arguments, you can get the base factor so unreasonably high <laughs> that the priors don't really matter all that much because like if you get a base factor of like yeah, I, <laughs> 10 to the power of like five or something, like that's a huge, or like 10 to the power of 10, like that's a huge base factor. And so long as your priors, so long as one of the hypotheses doesn't have a prior of like 0. 000 000 000 000 000 000 000. so long as that's the case, then you have a really powerful argument, right? So oftentimes you can kind of, um, bracket off consideration of the priors because you have this Bayes factor that can pretty much accommodate any any reasonable prior. <laughs> so that's that's what I do. And moreover, um, you can just focus on the the Bayes factor and just um, you can just say your conclusion could be really modest. It can be c conditional upon this evidence, right? 
the one hypothesis uh, is more supported by the evidence than the other. And in that case, in that conclusion, you don't even need to take into account the priors and you don't even need to say it's greater than 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0.000000 and so on. So those are my two responses. <laughs> yeah. So um, Trevor, who is an ex-Methodist, I think, um, says, no criticism of everything discussed, but could Joe offer some definitions of God to situate his clear explanations so far? Pretty please. Ooh. Uh, so it depends on which model of God. So a model of God is a way of conceiving of God, his nature, and his relation to the world. Um, so <laughs> which model of God? All of them define God so differently. Um, God, as I use the term, God is a, uh, a metaphysically necessary being that creates and sustains the concrete world. So, you know, tables and chairs and trees and quarks and things like that creates and sustains that. And it's perfect. So, you know, it's, it's all good, omnibenevolent, right? It's all powerful as, um, it, you know, all, all, omnipotent <laughs> and omniscient, right? So it's all knowledgeable. That's all that I'm packing in. You can add further things to that, right? You can say like, oh, well, he's also timeless or he's also temporal. But like when I just say God in these generic contexts, I just mean uh, usually a perfect necessary being that creates and sustains concrete reality. Um, yeah. Uh, and of course, you know, I think from perfection, what I'm building into that is moral perfection, power perfection, and knowledge perfection. So like omniscient, omnipotent, omnipotent. So that's what I mean. But there are different models of God and that's a super fun debate. And that's what I actually do research in. So... And, and is there a particular model that you would say is the most common um, and are there some flaws with that? And is there a particular model of God that you would say you have the most kind of sympathy for that, you know, like contrasting against that popular one? If So oh, reference class problem. Common in what reference class? Right. Um, well, <laughs> American Protestants. Um, no, I don't. I, yeah, maybe, okay. If we're doing just... American Protestants, then uh, the view would be something like so. Some people called it theistic personalism. The term in the literature that's generally used is neoclassical theism, um, which is this view that yes, God's necessarily existent. He creates and sustains concrete temporal reality, um, and so on. He's perfect, and so on. But also. Um, he exists in time. So, uh, you know, he has a succession of thoughts and things like that. Uh, he hears and listens to our prayers and responds to them. Um, you know, he uh, he's not absolutely, he isn't this kind of ineffable, pure act of being. Um, that's what you'll find more so in like um, medieval philosophers and some contemporary philosophers who are of a more kind of traditional classical theist then. But contemporary Protestant thinkers are generally going to accept like, um, you know, the perfections of God and, and he is metaphysically necessary, but they're just going to add that, well, he's temporal, he's changeable in, in certain ways. He can't go out of existence or anything, but he's, he can change in his accidental features. Um, and he is also not absolutely simple. So he might have some kind of, he might have distinct properties, say his omnipotence is not identical to his omniscience. That's what they're going to say. Uh, and, and maybe they might add this one. Uh, they might add that he's passable. So that, that is to say that, um, perhaps he is able to suffer or, you know, uh, experience something other than pure, undisturbable joy. Uh, so maybe during the Holocaust, God does in fact um, suffer along with his creatures, say. Right. Um, and so then the next question, I'll, I'll call this one the last one. I, there are some more questions, but um, just to wrap it up around there. So sorry, everyone else, if your question's not getting answered. Um, would you see your credence on the existence of the Christian God's resurrection? I'm not sure if they if they want to say on the God who resurrects or on the resurrection of uh, Jesus. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, those are those are importantly different. Yeah. Um, so, how would you see your credence on the existence of the Christian God of resurrection? Um, so, like. Okay, so that's interesting. So, so on the resurrection itself, I suppose. Yeah. The resur yeah. So let let's talk about the resurrection. Um, for for me. Uh, this is out of my, this is like, this is beyond my pay grade. Like, I don't do historical research. I haven't really. Eternal destiny depends on it, Joe. You're it. <laughs> well, I'm, I, well, here, here's actually how I, how I uh, talk about that. So Edward Fazer and William Lane Craig, they both think that natural theology is probably going to have to precede the kind of Christian based resurrection approach. Because if you don't have God within your ontology, then just the plurality, the plurality of, of non-God explanations is going to be more probable if you don't have God within your, of the resurrection, that is, if you don't have God in your ontology. You kind of need God in there in order to 
be a kind of necessary precondition for going into this analysis of the resurrection. So this is the approach that William Lane Craig takes. This is the approach that Edward Fazer takes. They say, we're doing the natural theology first. We, we get you to accept or something like accept God's existence. And then, and then we go into considering the resurrection and the historical evidence. And so I think I would agree with that approach. Like that's how we should do it because without God's existence kind of already there, um, you know, it's going to be difficult to, to run that resurrection argument. Um, but I'm stuck on that first step, right? I'm stuck, uh, not stuck, but I'm still trying to figure out whether or not, whether or not that's true. So um, uh, that's one way that I justify um, not looking at in depth uh, the kind of resurrection evidence. But another reason is that it's just beyond my pay grade. And I, I do research in like philosophy of time and like um, models of God. So that's out of my research interest. And so I can't really... Um, I can't really arbitrate much on it just because I haven't studied much. So uh, my opinions aren't going to be of much use here. Awesome. Uh, well, um, so just in conclusion then, if people want to kind of check out what you're doing, do you want to say a bit about, and it's something you've got coming up and where people can find you? Um, yeah. So uh, you can check out my YouTube channel, Majesty of Reason. I've also got a blog by the same name. Uh, and, oh, I got it right this time. Um, <laughs> it up on the left because I it well. Anyway, so it's like reversed. Um, so yeah, you can check out my book, The Majesty of Reason. Um, it's 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 the best book, believe me, folks. Um, <laughs> I, I'm just I'm obviously kidding. So um, so that yeah, you can check out my book. Uh, you can also uh, YouTube. You can also I mean, if you want, you can friend me on Facebook. <laughs> um, uh, it's just like Joe Schmidt or something. Um, and also coming up. Uh, I mean, I, I've got a video coming up on Leibnizian cosmological arguments. Um, I'm not sure when that- Two of the questions I missed were on that, so. <laughs> really? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I've got, it, it's based on, the videos that I'm doing are based on um, Alexander Proust's entry in the, the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology. Um, so I, that, that one's probably gonna be posted maybe in two weeks time or something like that. Um, and I've also got a discussion between uh, Dr. Ryan Mullins and Dr. Kate Rogers on classical theism and divine timelessness. And so both of those are, are really big names in, in the field of like models of God and things like that. Like Kate Rogers is one of the best contemporary classical theists. So i um, super excited for that discussion, but that's what I got coming up. And, and that's, that's where you can find me. Awesome. Great. Uh, well, thanks for watching everyone. And um, if you've enjoyed it, which I hope you have, then be sure to go and check Joe's stuff out and um, like the video and share it around so people can see what I think we're both trying to do, which is in some sense, uh, promote the kind of discourse that goes on around these types of um, ideas, these problems. And hopefully we've done that today um, and you've come across something new that you can now pursue down a rabbit hole and find out more about. So yeah, I'll see you all soon. Bye.